up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Unfortunately, I am sick because that's just how my life tends to go. So I apologize for the gross way that I sound and it literally looks like I'm about to fall asleep like at all times, but I promise you I'm energized and here for this video, just struggling through a cold. So today I'm going to be talking about the murder that quite literally canceled Halloween. I had a video similar to this last year um, and this is actually my most highly requested Halloween video. When I asked you guys to give me your suggestions, I think there were a couple thousand likes on this one particular case um, and that was literally more than probably all the other suggestions combined. I know this is something that has been covered quite a few times, but it's honestly one of the craziest stories that I've ever heard. And it's one of those where your gut feeling, I don't know, it ends up being right. I remember researching this and I'm like, there's no way something's wrong with this. And then sure enough, everything came around full circle. So let's go ahead and jump into the disappearance and murder of Shauna Howe. Shauna was 11 years old when she was abducted on October 27th, 1992 from Oil City, Pennsylvania. She was a sweet, sweet little girl, just your average 11 year old. She lived with her mom, Lucy, her stepdad, John, and then she had an older brother and a younger sister, and they lived on the 400 block of West First Street in Oil City. One of her favorite times of the year, I feel like this is a typical thing for most kids, is Halloween. She loved to dress up. She loved the idea of all the different kinds of costumes and the fun of going out at night and getting all of the candy. But her parents did not have the money this year in particular to really buy her an extravagant outfit, but she wasn't too worried about it. She knew that she was creative. She could throw something together. So she managed to find a gymnast costume within her everyday clothing. She was so excited about about it. It was this little turquoise and black striped um, one piece and then some tights and some gloves. She was really, really proud of the costume that she had created and she couldn't wait to wear it out on Halloween night, but she was also excited because she was going to get to wear it that night, the 27th of October, to a Halloween party for her Girl Scout troop. Now the plan for the 27th was that she was going to go to school and then from school she was going to head to a local nursing home. She was also in the choir and they were going to perform for all of the residents and then she was going to leave there and go to a church on First Street only about half a mile from her home and this is where the Girl Scouts were meeting for their Halloween party. Now, the church was close enough to where Shauna probably could have walked home if she wanted to, but first of all, her parents didn't seem comfortable with it for obvious reasons and second of all, she was terrified of the dark. Like out of all the things that scared her, the dark was the one thing that really got to her. So her mom decided she needed to be picked up from this Halloween party and brought home. But her mom also worked at a nearby town. So she actually had a shift that night. I think it's Franklin was where she worked and she would not be able to pick Shauna up from the party because she would be finishing up her shift. So Lucy told Shauna that she was going to arrange a ride for her to expect someone to be there and off Shauna went to go about her day. Now, later that night, Lucy ended up calling home at around 8 p.m. to check in on everyone. John was at the house with the other two kids, and he said that Shauna hadn't made it home yet. And Lucy immediately felt this terrible feeling in the pit of her stomach because she realized she had completely forgotten to schedule a ride for Shauna. At this point, she knew the party was definitely over because the Girl Scout parties did not last until late. Even the latest party didn't go past about 8.30ish. And she realized there are a couple options here. She either was walking home and just hadn't made it home yet, or maybe she left with a friend because no one was there to pick her up. So John waited at the house for a little bit to see if Shauna would show up. And at around 8.30, she still wasn't there. So he decided he was going to hop in the car and drive towards the church. Again, only half a mile away. Way. So he figured he was going to see her on the side of the road, that he would pass her on his way there, everything would be good, but that's not exactly how it played out. He went down the typical route she would have taken, the most main way with the most lights, which she would have been comfortable with and not so kind of tucked out of the way, and she wasn't there. So he decided to then check the church, and when he got to the church, she wasn't waiting outside and everything was shut down. It was very obvious the party had been over 
for a while. So he decided to take all these different alternative routes she might have taken home. It wasn't even likely that she would have. It was all like through neighborhood roads and back streets and scary alleys and dark, um, dimly lit places. But he wanted to be sure that she wasn't out there somewhere and he did not find her. He arrived home with the hopes that he somehow just managed to miss her and Shauna would be sitting at the house waiting for him, but she was not there. Finally, at around 9.30 before heading out of work, Lucy decided to try a couple of other different options. She called Shauna's biological father. She did not live with him. I don't know what the situation was exactly. I know he lived in a nearby town and one of her sisters lived with him and she wanted to know, you know, maybe she freaked out because she wasn't picked up. They knew I was working. Maybe they just called her biological dad, but he claimed that he did not have Shauna there with him. So she decided to rush home and figure out what on earth was going on. She got home sometime around 10, I think just before 10, and she decided to call Joey L, which is one of Shauna's very best friends. This was who she kind of clung to when she was at the different Girl Scouts meetings. And this is who she would have really been with during the party. Louie asked Joey L where Shauna was last seen, if she had been with her that night, if she even made it to the party, because keep in mind at this point, I don't even know if they knew where along the way something went wrong. If they just assumed she made it to this Halloween party or if one of them maybe took her place to place or if she went on her own, I have no idea. But Joey did confirm that Shauna was in fact at the Halloween party that night. She said that around eight o'clock the party ended and Shauna and Joey L both went outside and Shauna quickly realized there was nobody there waiting to give her a ride. So they both had off to walk home. They finally came to a corner pretty quickly in their walk where they would have to part ways and Shauna seemed a little bit distressed. She was nervous. She didn't want to walk home in the dark. So she asked Joey to walk with her, but Joey said it would be a better idea if they just walked back to her house. She told her dad Shauna needed help getting home and then he could take her. But Shauna didn't seem to want to go that far. She didn't want to bother anybody more than likely. So she disagreed and headed off on her own. Somewhere in that half of a mile walk home, something happened to Shauna. As soon as they heard this information, both Lucy and John decided the best idea would be obviously to call authorities because he had already driven almost all the surrounding streets on this entire walk home and seen absolutely no sign of Shauna whatsoever. Authorities showed up to the home to get more details and while they were there with the parents, one of them got a call over the walkie-talkie stating that earlier that night, around the time Shauna would have left the party, there was a report called in of a child abduction from someone that physically witnessed it happening. At the time it was reported, there were no young children that were reported as missing, so they weren't quite sure what exactly to do with this information because they didn't have any other information to help them figure out what was going on. They wondered if maybe there was just a kid that, you know, was upset with their parents and it looked like it might have been an abduction. They just didn't know until Lucy called and now they started to put together the pieces. At 8.06 p.m. that night, so quite literally minutes after Shauna walked out of this church, a man named Dan Payton was walking along First Street and he noticed a little girl in a gymnast outfit. He described it perfectly as to what Shauna was wearing. He noticed her walking down the sidewalk alone. He then noticed a man on the opposite side of the street walking the opposite direction. This man was very tall, very skinny. He was smoking a cigarette, wearing a hat and hat on, I think like an army jacket. As he was watching this happen, he then watched the man cross over from the other side of the street to the side of the street that Shauna was on and he seemed to approach her. Dan Payton then watched this man pick Shauna up and disappear around a corner and just seconds later, he heard a scream. Now Dan ran towards the intersection where this was happening at, trying to see what was going on, hopefully trying to help the situation. But by the time he turned the corner, all he saw was a small red car racing off. He didn't see anybody else, but he knew Shauna more than likely ended up in that vehicle. At this point, 
there are no cell phones. So he was kind of stuck with having to run around the entire neighborhood, knocking on doors, begging for someone to let him use the phone so he could call authorities. At this point, it was pretty much determined Shauna was the one that had in fact been abducted and seen thrown into this red car. Authorities set up roadblocks on all of the different ways in and out of Oil City. They wanted to speak with the different motorists passing by, make sure that they didn't see any red cars or see a car with Shauna in it. They also decided to inform police stations and I think a 100 mile radius of Shauna's disappearance just in case they saw a small red car. Over 30 officers went out to do grid pattern searches in the area she was last seen. They thoroughly checked the intersection she was taken at. They thoroughly checked all around the church, the entire area, and they went door to door asking if anyone had seen or heard anything because it was late at night. People likely were quieting down at home. To cover all their bases, they decided to still contact Shauna's biological father in case this had been some sort of mix up, but they were able to fully confirm that he did not have Shauna. At this point, we're, we're talking about 92. They ended up keeping Shauna's mom, Lucy, in the house because they were fully expecting a ransom phone call. This was pretty much what almost always happened when there was some sort of abduction, especially child abduction in this time period. So she couldn't even go out and help really look for her daughter because they needed her to be watching the phone. Shauna's extended family, however, came in and did everything they absolutely possibly could. They were helping in searches. They were organizing all kinds of different things. And by the next morning, the entire community had been made aware of the disappearance. And Lucy says she remembered looking out the window and seeing hundreds and hundreds of people gathered in the front yard and they were all there to search for her daughter. While searches continued for Shauna, authorities fully canceled Halloween. Completely canceled it. Halloween to them was just another opportunity that another innocent child could be snatched out of the total darkness. Shauna's uncle led a pretty large search group that searched a massive, massive area. When I was reading up on this and seeing the stretches of miles that he was searching with his different, you know, groups that were helping him, I was absolutely astounded. They pretty much left no stone unturned. And on October 29th, two days after Shauna was taken, one of his teams ended up finding something. They decided to search Colder's Hole. And this was kind of an area known for like camping and fishing. Um, it was tucked back in the woods. There was a river running through it. It was also known as a party spot. Teenagers that wanted to go somewhere and drink without anyone knowing, this is usually where they ended up. It was very, very secluded. Now there again was a river running through and a big bridge crossing over a particular area in Colder's Hole and someone noticed something on the ground kind of down near the bank of the water. As soon as Shauna's uncle saw what was found, he immediately recognized it to be the turquoise and black striped bodysuit that Shauna had been wearing that night. Authorities were contacted and they immediately rushed to the area to do their own search because typically when you find someone's belongings that's missing in an area, there's either going to be more items around that with different clues or potentially they will be somewhere in the area and they wanted to make sure she wasn't somewhere out in these woods, possibly in the water. So they searched extensively all over this entire area, but this ended up being the only item that they found. They rushed the bodysuit off to the lab they knew it had at least been over there overnight because it felt damp as if it had kind of been sitting in the dew in the morning. And what they ended up finding on this bodysuit was huge. There was evidence left behind on it from a sexual assault and there was enough for them to create a DNA profile. So they had a full DNA sample of whoever abducted Shauna. This was huge because if they found a match, they had their abductor. They had some sort of answers. But the next day, Shauna's case ended up changing from just a missing persons case, child abduction, to a homicide investigation. It was the 30th of October, the day before Halloween, and a man that was camping in the area, the same area that this bodysuit had been found, he noticed something near the water. I don't know if he was walking on the bridge or if he was walking down by the water, but he saw a little girl's body, I believe face down. It was Shauna. 
and she was only 500 yards from where her bodysuit had just been found the day before. She was again face down wearing shorts, socks that did not belong to her. Her shirt was on backwards and inside out and authorities were shocked and confused and the entire town was devastated. This entire area not only had been thoroughly searched by authorities, but Shauna's uncle had already searched the entire area as well. They didn't find anything the day before. There was no way if her body had been there 500 yards away from this bodysuit, literally less than 24 hours prior, they would have missed it. But that wasn't the only thing that was found that they would have expected to see the day before. Up on the trestles of the bridge, her shoes were placed perfectly, one facing one way, one facing the other, and there was also a empty candy wrapper nearby. It became very obvious that whoever abducted, sexually assaulted, and killed Shauna was now mocking the police and messing with them. When the autopsy was done on Shauna's body, the severity of what had happened to her was discovered. She had a shoe print on her cheek as if she had been kicked or her head had been pushed down to the ground by someone. She had been sexually assaulted and evidence of this was taken from multiple locations on her body. And the cause of death was a fall. Shauna had been pushed or kicked or thrown off of this bridge and had fallen 33 feet down to the rocky bank of this river. And she was alive when this happened. She wasn't killed and then thrown over. She was thrown over this bridge alive and she had remained alive for possibly up to 30 minutes after this was done to her. Absolutely freaking barbaric. But they didn't find certain things that they were expecting to see, which made this that much more confusing. Shauna had absolutely no evidence on her to suggest she had been restrained at any point in time. There were no ligature marks at all on her wrists or her ankles. So whoever had had her and had kept her for a couple of days had somehow managed to subdue her and keep her trapped without tying her up. The community was absolutely petrified. They, at this point, were fully on board with the fact that Halloween was fully canceled. But pranksters were just making this absolutely worse because they started to spray paint things like you'll be next onto different walls and things by the local elementary school, just further terrifying these poor young children. Parents came up with something they called Kid Watch, where they made sure the kids were safe at all times. If a parent couldn't walk with their child somewhere or something, another parent that could went with them. They made sure that all of the children walked in groups of, I believe, three or more. A lot of the parents armed their daughters with mace. This caused a lot of tension within the community because authorities felt like the parents were overdoing it. Arming your daughters with mace at a very young age, while yes, that could save their life, it could also cause a whole other slew of problems. People could get sprayed unnecessarily. I mean, one thing can lead to another, but parents refused to ever let anything like this happen to their children. The Rotary Club offered up a $500 reward, hoping that this would bring answers because Oil City had once been this big booming town, but the economy dropped and all the different trades that were huge for Oil City had kind of fizzled out so a lot of people were living paycheck to paycheck entirely struggling with money so they believe money could be a huge motivator but nothing really happened from this meanwhile authorities brought out everything they had they first started to look into the family because child abductions as i've stated before are typically done by family members stranger abductions are nowhere near as common as abductions by a loved one dna was taken from all of the males in the family including her 12 year old brother because they knew dna would be the one thing that could potentially match and solve this case none of the family's dna matched so they were able to rule them out and move on but there was a lot of speculation for a while on her 
uncle. People, I think, were just suspicious because he just so happened to leave the search party that found her different items and ended up finding the location of her body. This man was given absolute hell. Even after he was completely ruled out by DNA, there were still a lot of people that swore up and down that he was responsible. They then went to Shauna's school to see if there were any young boys there that maybe she had run-ins with or maybe had a crush on her, was like the secret admirer that maybe would have wanted to attack her. But this ended up resulting in absolutely nothing. So they then moved on to pretty much any male ever that might have ever come in contact with her. Everyone from Girl Scouts was checked out. I'm talking every girl that had a brother in Girl Scouts or, you know, a father that was present at any point in time. Every single person was checked. DNA was taken. They were covering every base possible, but still absolutely no matches. The FBI began to assist in the case because authorities could not figure out what was going on. They knew that it had to be someone local for this person to know about Colder's Hole, for them to just so happen to be on the street at night. They had set up all these roadblocks. Someone in the town had to have been the one responsible. And the FBI came up with a profile of this person. They claimed that the killer was likely a Caucasian male in their 20s, and they likely had a huge shift in behavior after the murder. This person may have quit their job or suddenly gone on vacation or maybe broken up with a girlfriend or maybe started to drink more or and take drugs. And they were asking the public to really think hard about anyone around them in the workplace or anywhere they frequented and see if maybe someone they knew, some male, exhibited this kind of behavior right after Shauna's death. And soon, persons of interest started to pop up left and right. A lot of people believed it was a random place to be wandering in and this man actually did drive a small car but after taking his DNA and doing a full search of his vehicle they were able to rule him out completely. Then a man named Michael was looked into because he lived only a few houses down from where Shauna was thought to have been taken and there were a lot of people coming forward saying he was a very odd very suspicious man. But by the time authorities got there to speak to him, they were informed that the day after Shauna's body was found, he left town, like skipped town completely, hopped on a bus, peace out, never came back. This was overwhelmingly suspicious for obvious reasons, but they didn't have pretty much any probable cause he was involved other than people just thought he was a suspicious person. So they couldn't really do much. They did attempt to locate him, but they weren't able to find him for years, but we'll get to that. They had checked so many people at this point and there was just nothing, but then they ended up getting a phone call. Someone heard the description of the person that put Shauna into the car and heard the description of the car itself. And they said it sounded like a man they knew named Ted Walker. This name wasn't so random. While everyone else either just stumbled into the crime scene or just was a suspicious person in the neighborhood, this guy actually knew Shauna. Shauna and all of her girlfriends would frequent this pizza shop and Ted Walker worked in the pizza shop. He was, I think, in his mid-20s or something. And he also had a red car and he was a smoker. Now, that already kind of encompasses a lot of what was seen. He was tall, he was skinny, and a lot of people that knew of him knew that he his behavior towards young women was kind of a little bit odd. He did have a son, so it was possible he just liked children because he just had his own son. That's not anything that's too strange. But when young girls would go into the pizza shop, Shauna included, he would always try to give them hugs, and it always freaked these young girls out like really badly and they would run from him and the parents always thought it was very strange and his behavior was very odd. So this seemed to possibly fit. This man fit the description. He had a red car, he smoked, he would have known of Shauna, he might have known areas she would be in. They thought they had their guy, but as soon as they got his DNA, they were told it was not a match and they were back to square one. In 1995, Detective Richard Graham was assigned to Shauna's case and he brought in help from a man named Robert Ressler. And some of you might recognize that name, uh, but if you don't, Robert Ressler is basically who Bill Tench's character is made after from Mindhunter, which if you don't watch that, what are you doing? First of all, second of all, this man was basically who 
created the idea of a serial killer. Robert Ressler was. He helped a lot in a case that I covered last year, Halloween, um, Son of Sam. And basically, he worked in the behavioral science unit of the FBI. He's interviewed so many different serial killers, and they had him look into this case. And he immediately said, well, this is obviously more than one person. And this was an idea that no one had really dabbled in yet or really considered, but it made perfect sense. She had no signs of ligatures. She had not been tied up at any point in time. It was very likely two people were involved and this is how they managed to keep her subdued for those couple of days before she was murdered. So authorities decided to broaden their scope a little bit and it didn't take long before they found two people that perfectly fit the bill. There were two brothers that had been wreaking havoc, essentially, all over Oil City for the entirety of their life. The O'Brien brothers, Tim and James. I think Timothy and James, technically, some people call them Tim and Jim. Either way, they had grown up in Oil City their entire life, and they both had very extensive criminal records. Uh, involving sexual assaults on adults and kids. In July of 1995, a 22-year-old woman was followed out of a bar in Oil City and a man came up to her and attempted to shove her into his trunk. She fought back, so his solution to kind of subdue her a little bit was to basically bounce her head off of the pavement. But he didn't realize he completely knocked her out and then it became too difficult for him to get her into the car and he realized he was taking way too long with, for this abduction. So to avoid being caught or spotted, he just ended up leaving her and driving off. The woman was able to give a full description of the man that had attacked her and he was named as James O'Brien. So one of the O'Brien brothers. While he was being charged for this crime, authorities started to wonder, again, if him and his brother could possibly be the two people thought to have abducted and murdered Shauna. But a couple of things didn't add up. It didn't add up anywhere near as much as the other two people so far. Shauna's murderer was tall and skinny, and the O'Brien brothers were the exact opposite, so the description already is way off. They didn't have a red car, and authorities saw that they both had actually been in jail at the time of the crime. So their DNA was never taken, it was never tested, and they were passed up because of this. So another possibility completely went down the drain. But then in 1997, another abduction happened in the town and it terrified everyone all over again. A four-year-old girl was abducted while playing outside with her friends by a man dressed in all black. She had been dragged into the woods and this is where her body was later found. It didn't take long for 17-year-old Nicholas Bowen of Oil City to panic and confess to authorities that he had done it. He had actually been a huge part in the search. He was there the entire time. He spoke to her family right afterwards. They wondered if maybe he was also responsible for Shauna's murder. So there were a couple issues with this as well. He would have been very, very young at the time she was murdered, but they took his DNA anyway and it ended up not being a match. So again, everything completely failed. Authorities had nothing, and with each year that passed, Halloween was a reminder that Shauna's killer was still living in the community around other children, and there could be more potential victims. They, after canceling Halloween in 92, then implemented a rule where you could only trick-or-treat before dark. There was no trick-or-treating at all after dark. There was just too much of a risk involved. It took until the early 2000s for the craziest, most random circumstances to bring some answers. Detective Graham had been on the case at this point for quite some time, and as detective work goes, he was working other cases, and he ended up having to question Tim O'Brien. So yes, we're jumping back to the people that had been completely ruled out. Since Shauna was such a high profile case in the area, most interviews with any male that ended up arrested in Oil City had some sort of questions about Shauna in it. They pretty much questioned any man that came in that was in the area at the time, could potentially fit the profile. And this was the exact same thing that happened in Tim's interview. And his behavior changed as soon as Shauna was brought up. Graham had asked him for a DNA sample. He was like, you know, I know this is kind of a random thing to be talking about. This is a completely different case, but just to be sure, we want to take your DNA. Tim seemed cooperative with it. He wanted to talk to his lawyer first, which is completely normal, uh, but he did seem very unsettled. 
The DNA came back as negative, but Graham had a feeling he was onto something, that at least Tim knew something. Graham went back to double check all the previous interviews with both Tim and James O'Brien. He wanted to go through all the documents, everything they had said, everything that had been checked, just to make sure there was no possible way. And he found the biggest possible flaw. Authorities had not double checked pretty much anything when it came to Tim and James O'Brien. I think likely because their description didn't match, they didn't have a red car, and then they saw, oh, they were in jail at the time. They're like, oh yeah, totally done. They took everything at face value. If they had checked, they would have seen that Tim and James were not in jail at the time of Shauna's murder. They had in fact been arrested, but they both had been released on bail. Graham at this point knew Tim's DNA didn't match, but what about James? So he immediately started the process to have James DNA tested and compared to the killers. And he started to dig into more tips and information on both of the brothers. A witness then popped up. On January 9th, 2002, a former cellmate of Tim O'Brien's came forward and said that during the 9-11 lockdown, Tim confessed to killing Shauna. So this was huge because it was possible that maybe Tim wasn't the one that sexually assaulted Shauna, but there wasn't really a huge way to rule out that he had killed her at this point. And then by February, James sample came back and it was a match. James DNA matched the DNA from Shauna's sexual assault. Both men at this point were linked, but Graham still couldn't get past the fact that they were linked, but they didn't match the description. They were so far off of the description of whoever took Shauna. So he started to wonder if there was actually a third person involved as well. After sifting through endless documents, he was led back to Ted Walker. You guys, this is one of those times where I, like I was saying before, your gut tells you something. And I kept saying when I was telling this story to my husband and, you know, going over the case facts, I was like, something so up with the O'Brien brothers and with Ted Walker. It's just too strange to me. There's no way they're not involved. And my jaw quite literally hit the floor when I saw how this came completely full circle. At the time of the murders, the brothers were living with Ted Walker. They knew Ted Walker. They helped him with different small jobs. Ted Walker had a red car and there were even more flaws in all of Ted's paperwork. Graham discovered that essentially the same thing had happened. Nothing was double checked. Ted again did have a red car, but he told authorities it was not working. It was a project car and it just stayed behind his house, but not a single officer went to check that the car actually didn't run. So there was a huge possibility the car was in full working condition. So authorities immediately went and grabbed Ted and answers started to pour out. Ted claimed that the brothers were staying at his home with him and his young son, and they were all joking around one night about how incompetent Oil City police were and that they couldn't do their job. They, you know, wanted to make a mockery of the police, essentially. So they formed this insane plan. They were going to kidnap a kid on Halloween in front of witnesses to ensure that someone called authorities, but they weren't going to do anything to this kid. They were just going to hold them for like 10, 15, 20 ish minutes until just, just long enough to watch authorities basically scramble and fail at their job. And then they were just going to drop the kid right back off. And they figured they'd never be caught because they thought oil city police were essentially just idiots. The story fit, but there were still plenty of gaps because how did it go from a joke to all of a sudden Sean is actually being sexually assaulted and murdered? So they took Ted's story and let him go, but then the local fire department ended up getting a call the following day that Ted was seen out back of his house burning what appeared to be a mattress. Now that is not the most suspect thing you've ever heard. On March 14th, 2002, Ted's home ended up being searched entirely top to bottom. They 
clearly saw he was trying to get rid of some sort of evidence and they wanted to see if there was anything else left because while the DNA for James did in fact match the DNA that was found on Shauna, it only technically indicated a sexual assault. So it was going to be very difficult to form a case against James and even a case against Tim would be even harder. And then Ted being involved, they wanted to get as much as they possibly could. And Ted ended up being all over the news when his home was searched because this was such a high profile case. And guess who called in? Dan Payton, the man that saw the abductor the night Shauna was taken. He called in and said, Ted is the guy that I saw that night. So again, they were able to fully link Ted. At this point, they decided to bring Ted in again and he changed his story. And something else that had kind of been disregarded, I guess you could say, over the years was the fact that Ted had actually been brought in a handful of times. They spoke to him a few times and every single time he changed his story. And I don't think it was ever anything super drastic, but like one de detail would change here and then another one over here and it would just flip flop. And this time was no exception at all. He said that on the night of the 27th, he went out to a store to go grab a few items. And while he was in the store, he saw his own red car pass by with Tim and James in it. He said they didn't ask to use it, so he was angry and got in his own car and followed them to the intersection where Shauna ended up being abducted. He asked the brothers why on earth they were using his car and they informed him it was because they decided to bump their plan up. They didn't want to wait till Halloween night anymore. They wanted to kidnap a child that night. And guess who happened to be walking down the road right there? Shauna Howe. Ted said he walked up to Shauna. He knew that she would kind of recognize him from the pizza shop. He asked her about Girl Scout cookies and then asked her for a hug, which she agreed to. And as soon as she did, he grabbed her and ran off to her. He then handed her to Tim who had already pulled the seat forward in the car so he could easily throw her in the car and they drove off. He said from there he went home and the brothers showed up shortly after he did. He claimed to watch them take Shauna up the stairs and then he started to cook dinner for his son because he honestly believed they were just holding her for about 15 minutes and then they were going to release her. But then he started to hear screams coming from upstairs. He went up there to check on everything and the brothers basically told him to mind his own business or his son would be next. At this point, Ted said that he freaked out because his son was now being threatened. So he grabbed his son and left the house for a while. And then when he came back, the brothers and Shauna were all gone. On March 19th, James was informed that his DNA was a match and they were wondering if he would just confess or what reaction he would show. But he pretty much denied absolutely any and all involvement and said there was no way it was an actual match. Now, authorities took quite a few years to gather the amount of evidence that they needed because they were really, again, worried because they didn't have a lot of physical evidence that they weren't going to be able to pin both Tim and James and Ted. During this time, while waiting to figure out this trial, Tim was convicted of two sex crimes, one on a six-year-old girl and one on an 11-year-old boy. He was also diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and was labeled a sexually violent offender. So... They again just had a string of horrific crimes trailing them. Then finally on July 3rd, 2004, Tim and James were formally charged with the murder, rape, and kidnap of Shauna Howe. And the following day, Ted was arrested in connection to the crime as well. By the 5th, Ted had taken a deal, so literally two days later, that required him to testify against Tim and James, and it would stick him with third degree murder instead of first or second, preventing a whole bunch of different kinds of sentencing that he wanted absolutely no part in. The trial ended up being moved out of county because it was so incredibly high profile and it was decided that Tim, who was 39 at the time, James, that was 33 at the time, they would be tried together, but Ted, who was 46, would be tried separately. Ted testified against Tim and James like he was supposed to in accordance to his plea deal, but again, he changed his story, which really messed things up. This time, Ted claimed that he came home and the brothers had already arrived after they abducted Shauna. And this meant that he was saying he didn't actually physically see the men bring Shauna into the house. He said that his son just said they brought someone in with them. This took away a huge piece of the puzzle, essentially, and prosecutors were 
pissed. And then there was the defense. So Tim and Jane's defense claimed that Ted was actually the one responsible for all of this. Like completely pushed everything off on Ted. They said that it was his car that had been used. You know, he was already admitting that Shauna was in his house, but this was very hard to prove because a little bit of physical evidence they did have pointed straight to James, but they even said they had an explanation for this as well. James claimed he had been out that day with a woman named Heather and he brought her home that night and they had sex and he said, if Shauna had been on the bed they had had sex on, there could have been some sort of transfer. But the prosecution immediately shot this down saying, no, James, sorry to break it to you, but you are the only person's DNA, the only other person that was found on Shauna. If in fact she had been assaulted by Ted or Ted had really played a huge part in this, his DNA would have been found on her, but there was nothing. At this point, evidence is very strong against James, but there's still a lot kind of working against them when it came to pinning Tim for this crime. The prosecution at this point was mainly relying on the witness statement from the cellmate, but it turned out being proven that this cellmate had fabricated majority of the story. So Tim basically had nothing else to pin him to the crime. But then on the 26th of October, so I think like years ago, as of yesterday, when you're seeing this, the jury ended up finding James and Tim guilty of second and third degree murder, kidnapping, conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Now this made Ted angry because Ted thought they were essentially getting off super easy, which I agree, but I mean, evidence wise, I'm honestly very pleased with what they were found guilty of. But he, at this point, thought he could essentially convince the jury that he wasn't guilty at all. He really believed he'd be found not guilty, so he tried to withdraw his plea deal to hopefully give himself a shot at being found not guilty, but this was denied and he ended up being sentenced 20 to 40 years in prison. These men will not get out. They were given consecutive sentences just in case any law possibly changed that might affect, you know, their sentencing and how long they're in prison. The judge said what they did was basically overkill and completely showed a total lack of caring of another human being's life. They threw an 11 year old girl over a 33 foot bridge and just let her lay there till she died. She wasn't even dead yet. Now, after this, the community was still really shaken up. I've actually seen comments from a lot of you guys that are from this area and you've talked about how Halloween was canceled where you lived. But finally in August, 2008, the town kind of went back to normal. A little girl that lived on the same street Shauna had, but she was not alive at the time that any of this happened. She did a presentation and a petition asking that the town go back to original Halloween, the rule be taken down that prevented them from trick-or-treating after dark. So after 16 years of a nighttime trick-or-treating ban, the kids were finally able to go out and trick-or-treat normally in 2008. And this was, I think, a huge step of healing for the community. This is just the craziest, craziest case to me for so many different reasons. I've already said a million times, this is one of those where you know you trust your gut, but it's also one where you see how suspicious someone can be, but then they end up not even being responsible at all. My first thought when I heard that someone fleed the whole entire town the day after a body was found is that that person has to be responsible, but they ended up finding that man I think like states away in jail and he his DNA didn't match. They have no idea why he ran, but despite how suspicious it looked, he ended up not being responsible. There are just so many different lessons in this case to learn. Keep your kids safe on Halloween. Do not let them walk alone in the dark. You never know. I have always said in all my videos, you stop believing in coincidences. That's what majority of police officers and FBI agents and you know all different kinds of people will say, but what a freaking coincidence that the O'Brien brothers and Ted just so happened to be on the same street Shauna was walking alone on because of the craziest circumstances. And it just will make you really, really think. But I'm gonna go ahead and go now. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howlin' Fam so we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys tomorrow for my next Halloween video. Bye.